I don't know how everyone feels about Zoom. I'm kind of Zoom tired out. Uh, I've been on Zoom since not eight, nine this morning. Um, the Zoom reality of awkward silences. I really love doing library talks. And what I love about it is to interact closely with people and being stuck in a box and having to look at my face. Uh, not a pretty sight, um, but uh, given the reality of COVID and rising numbers and everything, uh, it's a safer option. So we'll try to make the best out of it. Um, utilize the chat and uh, if the numbers are small enough, we can certainly open things up for, for questions. Usually I'm much more interactive. Usually I don't sit on a chair. It drives me nuts. I just like to move. Uh, and uh, so I'm moving on my chair a lot. Um, but um, lame jokes don't get better on Zoom either. And uh, so with uh, no further um, warning, I'm uh, going to share my screen now. And uh, the purpose of this talk tonight is really um, to provide a general audience with a little bit of a a crash course in the histories of the indigenous peoples of New England. And what we're going to do today is the maybe crazy task of looking at several thousand years of history and exploring what the experience of indigenous people has been and do that in less than an hour. Um, Partially why I'm doing this, especially this year, is because we have the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower. Um, this is when the, a group of Puritan separatists came across the Atlantic and they were right in the middle of the Atlantic uh, right now and hopefully they had prettier weather than we do today, 400 years ago. But the 600, 1620 and the Mayflower and the, as they're often called pilgrims rather as what I call them Puritan separatists, they've had a very strong hold on American culture. A lot of this has to do with Lincoln making, creating the, making the Thanksgiving holiday a national holiday. And that sort of brought the, uh, the Puritan, the pilgrim story to the forefront. And so for many people, even though we've had Virginia created before, not to speak of various French and Spanish colonies that existed before, in, in the mindset, the popular culture of, of many in the United States, the, the Mayflower is still kind of often seen as the founding event in, in, the, in the myth of the United States. And that's why it has a certain relevance too. But I am not really going to talk much about the Mayflower. And I am not going to talk much about the Puritan separatists. I am going for the most part, uh, to, I'm gonna to focus tonight on the history of the indigenous peoples who had been impacted by the coming of the Mayflower and many other colonists and, and what, um, these processes actually meant in their lives. And so that is what we're going to, to explore today. Um, and we're gonna look at this through the prism of legacies of the things that, that have remained. And so one of the um, things I like to start this talk out with is to um, look at a, uh, very common site that has been discussed uh, to some degree around the Commonwealth and, and maybe in my circles more so than others. And my point for tonight is not, is the flag of the Commonwealth, as some people say, is it, does it need to be, be abolished? Or as other people are saying, can we just stop the PC culture? Uh, that's not my point for tonight. But what I want to explore tonight is um, connect the historical legacies that connect to the history of indigenous peoples as we can see them in the, in the flag. And as I often do in my teaching too, is I present an issue and then it's up to my students to interpret what is going on, look at the facts that they are giving, and then it's, it's up to them to uh, make up their own mind. And when we look at the... Um, on the uh, uh, 
the left hand side, we have the current seal of, of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And on the right hand side, we have the, um, the historic seal of Massachusetts. And my students always find this kind of disturbing. Uh, they often talk about the, the, the Native American being naked and the, the, the leaves covering. And then we tend to talk about how that is really a um, very useless way of dressing in New England where it's often very cold. Uh, and what always blows them out of the water is the little uh, speech um, bubble that comes out of the Native American's mouth, which says, come over and help us. And so they're clearly put off. And then I often put them, contrast this directly to the new seal. And uh, usually their response, well, now the Native American is dressed. Uh, it's a little bit more respectful. But when we actually look at the history of the seal, um, there's a little bit of uh, hidden meanings in there too that the, um, the artist designed. Uh, the fellow was a name named Edmund Garrett. And he had sort of a, there's a lot of thought that went into the seal, which seems actually rather simplistic. So for one, it's, uh, I think one website that, that calls for the abolition of the state seal calls it a Frankensteinian construct. And I'm actually using this term because it's, it's kind of a nice way of underscoring what is going on here. So the body of the native person that you see um, on the picture is, a, uh, is based on, on a body that was dug out in an archeological site in Winthrop, Mass. But the head uh, is a 19th century uh, creation of a Native American model from Montana. Now there were plenty of in people, indigenous communities all over New England at that, at that point as they are today, but for many in white mainstream society in New England in the 19th century, the perception was that Native Americans had disappeared. And therefore one needed to have a, a person from out, out West to, to be used as a symbol. Now, that is just the body of the Native American, but I always then like to point out to the sword that is above the Native American uh, head. And that is a sword by Miles Standish. And those of us that know a little bit of history of, of Massachusetts, Miles Standish was the guy that the Mayflower uh, colonists hired to take care of defense issues. And he became sort of the first military commander of Plymouth Colony. And one of the first military interactions that he had with the Massachusetts involved the chopping off of a Massachusetts Indian's head that was then piked outside of Plymouth Plantation uh, for a while. And so sort of this chopping off of heads was very much part of the, of the brutal warfare that accompanied um, English colonization. And I by, I by no mean way mean to suggest that Native Americans did not uh, have brutality or, and, and that it, it was a very brutal world in both ways. Um, but sort of for, for many of my indigenous friends, sort of having this disconnection of head and body and then having the sword on top is a little bit offensive. And then speaking of chopped off heads, um, you have the belt uh, again on the current state seal. That is, a, is based on the belt of King Philip, which is usually at the, at the Peabody Museum in Harvard. And King Philip was another Native American uh, who during war had his head chopped off by uh, New English uh, colonists. And his head was also piked outside of Plymouth, actually for several decades. That must have been quite the um, gruesome sight. And I know some people are eating dinner, so I should probably... Uh, switch focus here. Um, but um, also of note is the, um, the, the, the motto of the state, by the sword we seek peace. And um, this always creates long discussions in my classes. But for me as, a, as someone that focuses on, on Native American history, I know there's various interpretations, 
but for many and uh, for many indigenous new englanders they look at this yeah by by the sword you did seek peace and and you pretty much got it um and so so this is the state seal this is sort of the meanings that there is various others in there but this is why some people have a have have a little bit of a hard time with the uh, with the um, with the use of the state seal, um, but I want to now switch gear to sort of explore what the indigenous world looked like a thousand years ago, and to really get a grasp of an understanding of the dramatic um, transformations that had occurred. And here it's again one of the legacies of. Uh, of um, of 1620 and really the legacies of colonization is not only our state seal, but it is also how we perceive the history. And in, in a lot of ways, there is a lot of myth making that is going on. So um, we have these new English myths when, uh, when English colonists arrived that, that uh, New England was a wilderness, that it was a quote unquote virgin land, an empty place that was not only empty, but also occupied by nomads. And that is kind of archeologically and anthropologically just not, it's just myth and very little history. Um, New England had actually been a, a place of incredible ecological stability. Uh, the fishing grounds, the shellfish population, the deer population have been incredibly healthy. And this had in many ways very little to do with um, this being a pristine landscape, but rather that you had very active landscape management by indigenous people that spurred the growth of wildlife, animal population, uh, to a very high degree. For example, there were targeted forest fires to take down the underbrush so that Native Americans could hunt more easily. There were methods deployed to increase the fish population. And so we tend to think of uh, hunting as a quote unquote, um, less advanced way because Europeans and, and Asian people had cows, they had chickens. But when we look at the animal population in the Western Hemisphere, there's very few domesticatable animals uh, that exist in, in our hemisphere. <clears throat> and so Native Americans really had no other way to procure meat and protein. So they had to uh, obtain um, meat, for example, through through hunting, but again, when you manage the whole landscape, it has more to do with like raising an environment or creating artificially an environment that is much more about say, free range pasturing that where you at the end get to kill your own meat. I think some hipster could really create a business idea out of that one. Uh, but so the point I'm trying to make here is that native people very actively change the landscape and manage the landscape to make it work for their ways of life. And when the first English colonists described this environment, they, were, they often compared the, the woodlands here more to parks where they could bring a horse and carriage and drive it into the forest. Uh, and that would very dramatically change because another issue that we have because of domestic animals in global societies or our interactions with animals when we're looking at the COVID-19 and, and the possible links with bats that um, Native Americans did not have domesticated animals and therefore had a lot fewer diseases and did not have the same disease environments as Europeans. And so the lack of uh, domesticated animals uh, would really hit indigenous people hard on that end, uh, that they were much more susceptible to disease. And that meant in New England, very likely that as many as 90%, and again, I repeat, 90% of the indig indigenous population perished in the late 19th and the 17th century as a result of disease. 
So this is an, another one of these uh, legacies is that of disease. So it's like ha having your path, past turn into myth, having to endure disease, and then of course, the, the state seal. But I also wanna underscore that indigenous communities in New England were, had high degrees of social complexity. They were very organized, very high, especially in Southern New England, especially in the coastal areas, very hierarchical societies. They were farming societies. In fact, it was uh, uh, Native Americans that, that had to teach the English colonists a thing or two about farming the crops that they were farming in, in the Americas. It's not that the New English weren't able to farm, but they were not familiar with the environment and the local indigenous crops. And so there were at least three Native Americans, one of them Squanto or Tusquantum, which I'm sure many people in the audience know, that, um, that helped the, uh, the uh, Puritan separatists of Plymouth to, to learn those ways. Um, Native uh, North America was a, a, a area of long distance exchange networks. The Midwest uh, and the South had cities the size of any European city. So Cahokia in, uh, outside of, uh, in Missouri outside, uh, had at least the same size as the city of London. So we tend to think of, uh, of Native people uh, not in that way, but really when we, when we, when we study the archeological past, the deep history of, uh, of North America, very little differences. Tenochtitlan, the, the Aztec uh, capital was three times the size of the largest Spanish city at the time of the conquest. So um, again, and there is really no wilderness, there is no virgin land, and there are no nomads living on this land. We have farmers who manage the landscape uh, and the animal population to a very sophisticated degree. They participate in long distance exchange networks that are very sophisticated. And we really have an indigenous history that goes back at least a, at least 10 millennia. There's already very long interaction before the um, quote unquote pilgrims or the Puritan separatists arrive. And so this explains the, the, the harsh reality that disease created in, in the Northeast and, and other things. So you have European fishermen, Basque fishermen, Portuguese fishermen who show up maybe even before Columbus, but certainly at the time or after Columbus. Uh, and this is one of the arguments that some historians argue about. I don't have a strong feeling either way, but either way is possible. Uh, you have shipwreck survivors. You have um, a lot of these fishermen as they're here catching fish, they're on land, um, drying their fish, salting their fish, uh, uh, processing the fish. They also then start interacting and trading with indigenous people, trading for fur. So we have early forms of the fur trade. A lot of the early missions are slave raiding missions. In a sense, how did Squanto learn English uh, well enough to teach uh, the English how to farm. Squanto was one of hundreds, probably thousands of Native Americans who were captured, put on a boat. The difference between Squanto and many other Native Americans is that Squanto uh, was maybe fortunate enough or, or, or just uh, by luck was able to make it back to the to the Americas. It's a very complicated story, but through various uh, routes uh, via Spain, where he was sprung free by Franciscans who didn't want Native Americans to be sold on a slave market, uh, made it back to, uh, to uh, England, where a rich investor purchased him as a servant. And this, serv this rich investor was also very active in um, in, uh, in investing in New England and uh, one of his officers decided, you know, we have been doing so much slave raiding in the region, it'd be really nice to have some translators that 
could help us negotiate for peace and tell them we actually want to trade. We don't want a slave rate. Uh, and during one of those efforts in trying to negotiate, uh, Squanto was sprung free and then made it back to, um, to his native homeland in southern uh, New England, where he then started interacting and translating uh, for, the, um, for the Puritan settlers. Uh, so there's a history of slavery. Uh, there's a history of indigenous slavery in New England that we need to talk a bit more about, and we will uh, later on in this program. There's also environmental impact. I mentioned the very vibrant fish populations, wildlife population. All of this stuff by the 17th century hits rapid decline. As in other indigenous communities, alcohol becomes an, uh, a problem in New England indigenous communities. Uh, colonization and the showing up of firearms that are becoming part of the fur trade all those create internal warfare dynamics that, that, that worsen things quite dramatically. And again, disease, disease, disease is, is one of the most harmful impacts for uh, the Native people in New England. So, in a sense, a lot of this stuff restates what I've already talked about. Uh, colonization, dispossession of land uh, becomes a big factor. Disease. Atrocious warfare by the sword, we seek peace, our state motto. Environmental impact, uh, slavery. So we have the slave raiding of people like Squanto, but what also happens uh, by the 1630s, uh, the Puritan colonists engage in a conflict with some of their indigenous allies against a indigenous group called the Pequot. And the Pequot get hit really hard. There is, for example, an entire town down uh, where Mystic, Connecticut is, burned down, mostly women and children inside. Most of them burn alive, at least 500, maybe 600, uh, give or take a few. Uh, but what also happens, this is what textbooks usually, if they talk about the Pequot War at all, what we tend to forget, there's a load of other violent incidents, not as dramatic, but you also have the capture of a lot of these Pequot Indians that are then brought back to rich landowners, uh, especially in uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony. So they're, they're working for families like the Winthrop and many other uh, members of the Puritan elite. And the Puritan elite is then starting to ask questions about, so what are these people? Are they servants? Are they war captives? Didn't the Romans say that war captives were slaves? And so what happens in the 1630s in Massachusetts is that we are in New England, but in Massachusetts in particular, is that we have a very vibrant discussion about the status and the intellectual, if I can call it that, sorry, underpinnings of slavery. And this conquest of the Pequot and the... Um, the um, I don't know if you want to call it the enslavement in the P of the Pequot or the Pequot servitude. Historians argue about, about those, that terminology uh, till they're blue in their faces. Uh, but to make a long story short, as a result of this debate, uh, by, the 16, by early 1640, uh, Massachusetts, uh, by the early 1640s, Massachusetts is the first English-speaking colony to legalize slavery. And we talk a lot about 1619 and Virginia and what we tend to forget, just like when we like to talk about the Confederate flag and we don't look at our state symbol, also how really Massachusetts played a very incremental and, and, uh, and uh, important role in the establishment of slavery. And some of that, a lot of that slavery has to do with people of African descent. Uh, for example, a lot of Pequot uh, servants are sold into the Atlantic slave trade, and then the rich landowners purchase African colonists. But what we often tend to forget in New England is also that through the 17th century, uh, the majority of slaves in New England and the majority of servants in New England are people of Native American descent. And then it's gradually that the people of African descent 
increase in numbers intermix with Native Americans. So we have uh, a lot of people of mixed ancestry that, that, that emerge out of this, this system. And by the 18th century, uh, people of African descent make up the majority. But, but so Native Americans, because of the Pequot War, because of the, um, the racial makeup of, of the slave population, play a very central part in that history of, of New England. Uh, with, with that, of course, slavery comes uh, racism, uh, the issue of poverty for indigenous populations, discrimination, and the dismantling of entire communities in this process. But what we also need to uh, remind ourselves, and that is an other important part of the story, is that New, New England's native population adapts. They show incredible resilience. Many communities survive through these almost insurmountable challenges. Uh, there's a continuous uh, presence, uh, persistence, and there is a struggle to maintain sovereignty in these communities. In these communities, so so Native Americans uh, do a lot in order to try to survive a lot of these pressures, and this is really what I want to focus the um, remainder of of the talk here. Now, again, there is a lot of war that is going on, and that has an that has an impact. So. Um, you have King Philip's War, for example, that takes place in the 1670s. And I, I've thrown in a couple of numbers here. So in uh, the indigenous population in Southern New England in the early 17th century is about 140 to 120,000. And again, that seems like a very small population, but let's again, keep in mind the London's population in the medieval period was about 12,000 12, people or 20,000 people. So the, the, the global population was probably less than half a billion people at this point. Uh, and New England was sort of a, one of the less densely populated portions of, of the Americas. But already prior to King Philip's war, that population as a result of disease war had shrunk down to about 30,000. Uh, and by that point you had about uh, 50,000. And then King Philip's War hits, and the Puritans and their Native American allies uh, fight a war against uh, an anti-colonial resistance movement that we today say was led by King Philip. But King Philip was only one of many players in this movement. And by the time this conflict is over, some historians estimate out of those 30,000, uh, seven out of 10 do not remain in Southern New England. So many are like about one to 2,000 are sold into Atlantic slavery. This is what happened to King Philip's wife and his son. King Philip, as we talked about earlier, has his head chopped off and piked up. The, um, the Wampanoag leader, Wiedemu, she also has her uh, head chopped off and, she, and her head ends up outside of Taunton. Uh, we have a concentration camp-like uh, structure on Deer Island where we have a lot of the Christian Indians that actually ironically fought on the side of the English during King Philip's War. Then uh, there's a lot of resentment against Native Americans during King Philip's War and the Native population in these praying towns are put onto uh, Deer Island where they are very poorly fed uh, if uh, they're not allowed to cut down any trees. And I don't know, I mean, I, I've been on Deer Island a few times and I, I like to take it in. And one of the times I was there was during, right as a, as a hurricane was bar barreling down the coast. So there were these waves and, and it was a mild September day. The winds were warm, but I was just imagining being on this island in the Nor'easter or in a, in, a, in a fall storm or a spring storm and not having appropriate shelter. And I was there with my kids and I was just imagining what kind of hell people um, would have been through being on this island. And again, when the Puritan population realizes, oh my God, we're losing out to uh, King, Phillips and King Philip and they're asking Native Ameri American allies on the island, can you help us with the war effort? These people go out and, and go back fighting while, while their families, their parents, their children stay back on the island. 
Uh, these people help liberate uh, English captives like Mary Rowlandson, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, the contribution of uh, Native American allies in the war effort is quite dramatic, and it creates a, a proud tradition in, in Eastern Massachusetts communities where uh, Native people have fought, are fighting in pretty much every colonial war on on the side of the English against whoever the enemy is through the American Revolution. Um, but also part of that seven out of 10 is people that just flee the region. So I live up in, in the Lowell area. We have uh, two big indigenous communities up here and they just bash for the, for the hills of, of, of Northern New England and, and they're hiding in the foothills of the White Mountains. And they come back after King Philip's War, some of them, then 14 of their kids are pretty much put into servitude and the rest of them skedaddle back up north and they join uh, communities either in Western New York, uh, uh, Maine, or up in Canada. A lot of them probably ultimately end up in uh, the Odenak, on the Odenak Reservation, or as it's often called in the colonial records, it's St. Francis. Uh, and so, um, I have a picture up of Hannah Dustin and, and sort of the, the Native American scalp that she holds to sort of, again, we tend into our popular histories, we tend to talk a lot about Native American scalping, but we, what we tend to forget is how uh, various colonial governments in uh, New English colonial governments uh, gave quite high, quite high payments uh, for Native American scalps. So, um, and that was, uh, it's quite a tragic and, 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 and depressing history. And again, there's violence on, on both sides, but, but, but I think sort of the, the settler, like the settler colonists variations of the story make the English the victims. And of course, there's the other bad narratives that only makes Native Americans victims of violence. So there's, there's plenty of violence to go around and makes the 17th and 18th century a really a brutal period to study. But as I promised, um, I also want to talk about the story of survival here. And I think that is an important part of the story too, because the way most textbook handle this, again, King Philip's War is done. There's no more history, Native American history in New England. And that is complete and utter bogus. Um, we have strong indigenous communities surviving all over New England, uh, indigenous people survive working as slaves and indentured servants. Christianity uh, plays an other important factor that you have Christian churches, Native American minister, like William Apis here in the picture, uh, that play an important role in advocating for indigenous communities, advocating for indigenous political rights, uh, educating Native American children to read and write. Uh, the, the literacy rate already in the 17th century among indigenous New Englanders is extremely high. Uh, they can read and write, and it makes for some very interesting records when you study that past. Uh, Native people like Betsy Guppy Chamberlain that you see in the picture here, she works in the factories of Lowell. Uh, and while she works in the factories of Lowell, she is... Um, Quite, she also writes uh, for the New England offering and for the Lowell offering. And she writes very interesting uh, stories about women's rights, but she also writes a lot of interesting stories about indigenous rights. And so people like William Apis and Betsy Guppy Chamberlain in the 18th century remind people in New England, hey, there are still Native Americans that are here and we are still here. Uh, you have Native Americans working in agriculture, the whaling industry, which plays an important role as a global energy supplier and really plays an important role in the New England economy, has a, a strong indigenous population. Uh, in northern New England, you have Native Americans working in the logging industry or river driving. Those are the people that are having that dangerous job of bringing the, the trees down rivers. Uh, that then help in construction and, 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 and boat building and so on. You have Native Americans in tourism, in tourist trades, can, canoe making uh, as domestic labor. So Native Americans throughout the 18th and 19th and early 20th century, uh, 
they survive as throughout the 20th century. They survive in all kinds of indig- uh, in all kinds of mainstream societies, uh, in jobs all over mainstream society. So um, I'm just checking on the time uh, to make sure that I we have some time for discussion because I can drone on on this forever. And this is again the the problem with the Zoom reality. Usually I've interacted with 15 question at this point, 40 minutes in, and this is what what kills me about Zoom. It's like uh, blah, blah. anyway. So. Um, your stuff, if you'd like, I can. There have been a couple of questions, so if you'd like to stop and ask, we can freshen things up a little bit. That's maybe a good if, thing. If yeah. you'd like to do that, we can certainly do. Um, yeah. The first question when we were talking about the state seal was wondering if there, you know, what you know about the movement, uh, anybody moving to change or to, to challenge that seal, um, because yeah, of there, how it depicts people. There, there is a campaign for that, and I think even Charlie Baker. Um, a few weeks ago was, was asked about the seal. And he, I think he just smiled and laughed. It's, like, it's probably something one ought to talk about. And I think he's a little busy with COVID-19 right now, which I, I guess you got to have your priorities straight. Um, so yes, there is a campaign on that. And there's websites. I think you, you just type in abolish the state seal. Um, I can also, if you remind me, send you a link and there, there is something there. And I don't want to necessarily advocate that. I'm a historian, so I like the past and I like symbols. And I think my job is not to tell people how they, if you've certainly come to that conclusion, more power to you. Uh, but my job is like, this is what it means and then come to your own conclusion. So I can certainly share with that. And people want to contact me, I can certainly, can also contact me if they hate my talk. That happens <laughs> too. <laughs> Thank you. Another one, I don't know if you know much about Chief Chickatabit, um, because Ch- he, uh, he lived in, you know, what is now Quincy and, you know, had a summer home in the Blue Hills and, and spent a fair amount of time, you know, right here where a lot of people joining us tonight are, are quite familiar. So I don't know if he's going to come up, but there's been some people are hoping to hear his name and, and, and anything you know about him. Sorry. <laughs> I, I mentioned very few names here and this is sort of like, uh, yes, because, yeah, Sorry. And I, okay. I'm sure there's probably people in the audience that are way more knowledgeable to talk about him than I am. So um, I've spoken with surviving descendants of yeah. Chief Chikatab, who I know are, you know, have been living in Quincy. So yeah. yes, those people are definitely out there. They, they should give a talk okay. on that. All right. Thank you. If people have additional questions, please feel free to ask them. Uh, use the chat. Use, you know, I am looking at YouTube and Facebook too. So yeah. let me know. Uh, and and if, you'd, if you'd like me to kind of just bring up questions as they come up, I can certainly do that because I know it is hard. I don't want to interrupt your flow and everything's going great. But No, that's fine. I'm, I'm pretty much uh, always on, on the fly. Um, okay, so no, great. I mean, it's, yeah. Um, so the dynamic started to change quite dramatically in, in the 19, in the mid 19th century. And so what is happening there is, and this, this connects back to why did we have a Montana Native American head on our state seal is the people in, um, so, uh, in, in Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, they increasingly felt, well, Maybe these people were Native American at some point in the past, but they have intermarried so much that maybe they are just not Native American. They weren't saying maybe, they just had themselves convinced that these people were no longer Native American. So I shouldn't beat around the bush. And again, what we need to remember, again, I mentioned that a lot of people, Native American men worked in the whaling industry and that a lot of Native American men worked in, in the militias fighting. So these were two industries that had extremely high mortality rates. And so what ended up happening in indigenous communities is you had a, a lot of men died out. And so for women to find um, suitable partners and spouses, they started to look at other communities. And so given the, 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 the world of servants, there was a lot of intermixing with African Americans, and then there was also a lot of intermixing with uh, white Americans, especially recent immigrants, and especially sort of of the lower um, cl- classes of New English society. 
Um, and so in the minds of, of a lot of um, mainstream observers uh, in Boston that, that were calling the shots, they just thought, well, these are no, no longer Native American people because also this is the time of the Great Plains War. People have very peculiar perceptions of what Native Americans should look like and the indigenous communities here, even though they kind of have functioned for three, 400 years, or at this point, 300 years, they still have their chief structure, they have still have their chiefs, they have their leadership structures, they have their indigenous churches that operate very separately from others. Just to, to mainstream New Englanders, they are Native Americans no more. And so that creates, um, and, and a, in a sense, that creates a, a pressure on that we need to do something with the remaining reserves. So what has happened is you had like many indigenous communities and they often tended to be 10, 20, 30 people that were spread out throughout New England. But in the 18th and 19th century, these become fewer and fewer and native people, indigenous people move to the larger reserves. So this will be communities like uh, Mashpee in, um, on Cape Cod or it would be the Narragansett country in, in Rhode Island, it would be Pequot country in Connecticut, uh, you name it, uh, Nipmuc country uh, out around Grafton uh, in, in, um, in the Worcester area. Um, and so we still have these reserves in Massachusetts, Connecticut and Rhode Island, but the Southern New England governments decide, okay, we're gonna close these reservations down or reserves down. And pretty much you now guys have now the right to vote. Uh, you get a little bit of land. The rest of the land that's left over is sold off. Uh, you start paying taxes now. And here we are. And it's the indigenous communities that were very much opposed to this because they knew it would destroy their community base. It would, or they, they didn't know, know that and they actually did not destroy their community. Day. But they saw this as a very active threat to their position. So they fought these decisions and there was a lot of political activism and the state governments very much pushed this through. And it's kind of an interesting story because later on, because Native American policy in regards to indigenous populations is, is a federal prerogative. So it can only be the federal government that can make decisions on abolishing indigenous communities. So Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island pretty much violated the constitution and federal law. And that would, in the 1670s and 1680s, would be used as an, an argument and, and from there on on by indigenous communities in the Northeast to regain uh, federal recognition. Um, but in the 1860s and 1870s and 1880s, it was really a brutal period uh, because indigenous communities lost a lot of foothold. But they continued to maintain their communities, uh, their institutions. Uh, it's people like uh, Joseph Nicolar, who is a Penobscot Indian uh, in Maine. He writes this, he publishes, self publishes this brilliant book. Uh, in the 1890s, uh, which you read this and it's like, I sometimes I can't believe this is from the 1890s. It's kind of like the writing of, of if you're interested in African American of W.E.B. Du Bois, where you have just a guy who's just so far ahead of his time that it's like it takes historians like me, white historians to the 70s, 80s and 90s to maybe catch up. And I don't think we have still. And Joseph Nicolar's work is just from an anthropological perspective it's just so interesting. Uh, so these are people that maintain uh, community history and you have hundreds of people in the communities that fight politically, that push one lawsuit against the other, against the state government. You, have not the, you don't have the right to abolish or terminate our state. And they lose time and time again in the courts. You have uh, people like Gladys Tantaquidgen of the Mohegans uh, who with her family members, sorts this museum of artifacts of Mohegan history. She herself was a trained as a indigenous medical specialist, but she had a PhD in anthropology from UPenn. And um, 
incredibly bright person, incredibly able to bridge the two worlds. And the, um, the collection of historic documents that she put together would help the Mohegan Nation to obtain eventually, a hundred years after termination, uh, to obtain federal recognition again. And so it's, it's the people like Joseph Nicolar, Gladys Tantaquidgen of that uh, post-termination generation, just like Apis and Betsy Guppy Chamberlain that always reminded uh, people that, hey, indigenous people are still there. You might tell us that we're terminated, but we're really not. Mashpee is still in an indigenous community. We're still up there. Uh, uh, you go to Martha's Vineyard, uh, the, the Aquinas, very active. They maintain their communities. So yes, termination is a policy, but it's not necessarily a reality of ind for indigenous people. And it's people like uh, Tantaquidgen and Nicolar that, that, that keep that fight going. And they're really two stand-ins for hundreds of Native Americans uh, from New England that, that fight this fight. The other thing I want to briefly mention here is sort of the sad history, and that, that's another legacy, the sad history of what uh, mainstream American New England society called the welfare of Indian children. And so that is the boarding schools and residential uh, schools. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the words of uh, one boarding school official, to kill the Indian, to save the man. Um, so small young Native American children, teenagers were brought into these residential schools. When they uh, spoke their native language, they got <clears throat> beaten and severely punished. Uh, it's a traumatic experience. Having talked to boarding school survivors, and he's, I mean, it's heartbreaking in the 80s, uh, these very lovely old ladies that just tell you about this experience breaking down. And it's, it's just a very moving experience. And then they talk about how they then haven't, because of this experience, did not teach their own children their language. And so you have this cultural trauma that goes on over generations, but you also have this cultural language loss uh, that it is going on over, over generations too. And it's even the grandchild. I mean, I'm looking at, 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 at one particular case of, uh, the grandmother that had gone through the boarding school didn't teach her daughter, but then her granddaughter is now a language instructor on a Seneca uh, reservation in, in New York. So the cycle continues and sort of the, the example of Tant Tantaquidgen and people that are trying to change their community, but it's an intergenerational trauma that is hard to come back from and that indigenous societies all over the country and the Northeast really struggle with and to overcome. The other issue that has given even far less attention, and thankfully there has been a documentary called Dawnland that is talking about this issue in, in the state of Maine. So if you're interested in this type of history and you haven't seen Dawnland yet, I would, I would encourage you to check that out. Um, it talks about the family separation in, in Maine. And so that was a, a very common practice all over, not only in North America, but in Australia, New Zealand, that indigenous kids were just ripped out from their families, ripped away from their families, and then put with white families. What is interesting about, uh, about the state of Maine and, and what happened in this building that you see in the picture uh, is that this continued even after the federal government in the 1970s passed a law that made it illegal. And, and, and the snafu that is going on in the state of Maine right now is that the state of Maine apparently still endorsed policies of this type that have actually been un outlawed by federal law. And ha it has created tremendous, just like the boarding school, tremendous intergenerational trauma. You talk to people, it, it's, just, it's just a horrible, horrible thing. Um, so... Um, But again, there are the legacies and there are the struggles, but there's also the importance of the continuation of the fight that indigenous communities have, um, have continued to persevere, 
they have continued to survive against often very dramatic uh, and in throughout horrific circumstances. Uh, the, the fight for state and federal recognition, uh, the, the fight for land claims. It's a continuous struggle. It's by far not done, but there has been some progress made and then some step backs uh, over the last 30 or so years. Again, not every indigenous community in New England by any chance is recognized by state authorities or federal authorities. It's an extremely costly process. It's also a kind of offensive process because you would have to, again, get approval by white mainstream society to sort of be granted that you are Native Americans, even though you've always grown, lived in a community, in a family structure where everyone always said you are indigenous and where the structure is pretty much historically established that you are indigenous. Um, and so to many Native Americans, it's also one of those things that they, they don't like that process. And I, I, don't, I don't blame them. It's also been in the last, since the 60s and 70s, a lot of indigenous nationalism, uh, indigenous activism. Uh, there have been protests, for example, in regards to the Deer Island site. And it, I think we're finally gonna get some commemoration there. Uh, Plymouth, uh, rock every Thanksgiving for the last 50 some years has been a major demonstration where Native Americans from all over New England and beyond come up, come to Plymouth and remind Native uh, and remind mainstream Americans as we're celebrating Thanksgiving. Yeah, enjoy your turkey, but guess what? We're still here. And in in Plymouth now too, there is a lot of interesting um, way of how we uh, commemorate. Uh, what has happened that there is now more and more signage presence that acknowledges an indigenous past. And I guess this is what I'm trying to do with this talk too. And I, I understand this is as depressing as anything. And I apologize for that. Um, my kid always shake my head. Uh, how do you do this, daddy? This is just, they, they listen to me for five minutes. I'm like, we're done. This is too depressing, daddy. Um, and so, um, uh, but I also think this is an important past that we need to talk about because it's, it is part of, of who we are as a people, and it's an important history that we need to remember just for the sake of the people that had to endure this history, but also for our own sakes that we don't make the same mistakes in the future. There are struggles for economic and cultural revitalization, uh, like many rural communities, uh, for example, especially in, the, in, in, in Northern New England, indigenous communities there as everywhere are struggling. Uh, the opioid crisis has been extremely uh, devastating in indigenous communities. Uh, and again, you throw in the mix of alcoholism, intergenerational trauma, it does not help. The struggle for language preservation is certainly going on. Many battles to fight, but uh, people continue uh, to, to, to fight and people are continuing to make a difference. And I think that is a very important thing to, to keep in mind as well. And I think I want to like cut it off at this point and leave some, some room for discussion because I feel like I've depressed people enough at this point. Sorry. I mean, it's obviously important that we do spend time and people are here because they want to engage with these issues. And, and I don't think, you know, I'm sure people are, I know people are learning a lot tonight and, and some of the horrors are, are just immense. Um, one of the, what, somebody asked a question about the boarding schools and if you could explore a little bit more, I know, I think a lot of us have, have heard of these boarding schools. I know people who went to them, you know, or who were sent to them in the Dakotas um, and out West. Were there boarding schools in Massachusetts, in New England and in Massachusetts uh, that were of this, like, let's take your kids and, you know, re-educate them to this cultural brainwashing? There, there are some in, um, but it's, it's a bit of a struggle. Most of them are actually then shipped out. So it's often a tradition. Like one of the big ones is in, um, in uh, Hershey, Pens Carlisle, Pennsylvania. That, that's a big one. And so a lot of kids are shipped out there. Um, then there is a couple of them in New York. Sometimes they're not federal. Like Carlisle was a federal. Sometimes they're church-affiliated schools. 
And then some of the kids are brought over into Canada, which has a very um, also sad history with that. And then at the Penobscot, they're just fighting really hard to send their kids to Catholic school that they can't so that their kids don't go to boarding school. And New England, Native Americans, and there's a long history of that that goes back all the way to uh, Stockbridge in the 18th century, where we had sort of the first e effort of having an, a Native American boarding school uh, that Native Americans then shut down. And there's a reason why indigenous people in, in New England have been very, um, out, very active in maintaining their own school and keeping control over their um, school systems. And, and that, of course, termination, especially in Southern New England, does that. So it's probably not as big of an impact uh, as, in, as, as we would be out West, uh, where the reservations are really often kids are just snatched up, uh, but it does have an impact here as well. And then especially uh, uh, just like the uh, Haudenosaunee or Iroquois that I know and, and have talked with a lot on this issue in a prior, um, li not prior life, but, but sort of in, in, at, at different points in my life. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they, there's just smaller schools in, in lots of places. How recently were these schools in operation? Because I know, and if you look at like Rabbit Proof Fence was a, a st same story was happening in Australia and it was happening in, I think in the eighties. I mean, it was very, very recent. Um, when do you, I mean, and I know even some of the ones out in Western, in, in the Western parts of this country were still operational in the seventies, at least. I don't know uh, locally how, you know, if you have a sense of how, you know, th these it's, elderly women that you talk to, when were they going? Do they know of, you know, when did they end? It's um, the um, the federal government gets out of that business in 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 the 1930s uh, with the New Deal, um, but there's still continuously church schools and 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 private schools that are run. And I know several. There's at least two or three in New York State that operate into the 60s and 70s, and then increasingly, the boarding schools are then. Increasingly, as the boarding school population goes down, the family separation goes up. There was a, um, on, on one of your slides, somebody on, uh, on one of the social media channels uh, was asking, and just, um, you were talked about the person who was an incredible writer in Maine, um, and they were just wondering if you could repeat how to spell his name so that they could go back and look, um, and, and just look him up. I think, I think I've shared him on your reading list. Okay. Uh, that, that, that I, uh, so he's he's on there. Um, I'm like I'm looking for. Oh, there's a chat. Duh. Uh, but then the person on the um, on the social media won't necessarily see that. That's okay. I will go ahead and put a link. Anybody can go. Yeah, it, it's yeah. Nicolar N I C O L A R, and I'll go and put. It. He is on the the list, and 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 thank you for reminding me. I will put a link um, so that everybody can go and see that reading list, um, and I'll share that both here on, on Zoom and across the other social channels um, that uh, Christoph put together for us. Um, a list of resources that people may like to to if you'd like to do more research into this. And I've gone and put in links so you can find either in our catalog at the, from the library, or a couple of them were such that you can actually just find them free online so um, I'll, I'll share that list before the end of the evening so yeah thank you for, for bringing that up I'm glad you did um, we had somebody who, who asked in the chat here uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and read this to you uh, Christoph is um, so they wrote I'm a Lowell native and while I'm aware of our indigenous natives of the Merrimack Valley find it interesting and it never occurred to me when we celebrate so many cultures in Lowell from the Irish Greek and French that we've been in Lowell for so long as well as all of the Southeast Asian communities that have become part of us since the 70s but don't ever remember even considering the original natives being part of the current population in Lowell or part of these larger cultural celebrations. I mean, it does seem we talk about cultural inclusivity, but what about, you know, the, the first human cultures that were living here? I think that's just an observation. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a good point. And there's the uh, greater, uh, it's called Glicka. Let me uh, write that down on the chat too. Um, the greater Lowell in the, uh, Indian Cultural Association, mm -hmm. uh, which is which is quite active. They they put together a powwow every year, maybe even more. And it's it's a it's a big powwow. It usually happens on the veterans uh, facility in Bedford. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there is a slew of of cultural organization that are all over 
actually, if you go to some of the powwows, you kind of get get a get a sense of of how how diverse the population is. Yes. So it sounds like incidentally, I did a uh, shameless self promotion. I did mm -hmm. did do a, a a piece on local access. If you put in Native Americans of Lowell, you you can hear me. You'll find you. All right. Yapping about this topic for about forty five minutes, and if you haven't been bored enough tonight, <laughs> you can you can get some extra punishment. But. Yeah, I think it would be fascinating, uh, you know, mentioning powwows, and I've been, I haven't been to any powwows out here, but I had some friends um, in Colorado, and I went to, like, in Denver, there's a big annual powwow um, that I went to a couple of times with some friends. Um, I don't know if you have any tips for people who've never been to a powwow, especially, you know, for white people in our audience who may feel a little bit out of place. Um, you know, what was it like the first time? And are there ways that you'd recommend experiencing it and being, you know, appreciating the dancing and the music and the food? Um, you know, tell, can you tell us a little bit about your experiences and, and encouraging people if you think it'd be a good idea to go? I mean, I'm not encouraging voyeurism or exoticizing of it, uh, but they are pretty impressive if, uh, you know, they're just incredible displays. Yeah, I mean, they're going to be less than what you're used to from out west. Um, but I think it's a cultural experience. And I, I find that people are, are super welcoming. And I mean, it's like, it's like with everything, if you go into, like, I feel like we don't do this enough. And, and maybe it, being an immigrant and constantly having to put and having worked on immigrant populations too, and being going to like temple swaminarians and, and, I'm usually just very open to like, okay, I'm an idiot. I don't know anything. Can you explain to me and just ask questions nicely and, and try to be yourself and try not to be condescending and be respectful. And I find most people actually are willing to share. And sometimes you come across the people that don't want to share. And I feel like you got to be respectful of that too. Um, then I just say, I I'm sorry. I didn't mean to offend. And uh, yeah, that's fair. Something that, uh, you know, as I think about, uh, you know, indigenous folks in the New England, I think about going out route two. Sometimes I think about the Mohawk Valley uh, and the Mohawk Trail. And I don't believe we talked about the Mohawk people at all. Um, I, I don't know if you know anything about kind of the, if, if there's a different history as we go out that way, but that may be something that's familiar to people. Um, I, I, I don't know if you have anything to share when we think about the Mohawk folks. This, this could be a diatribe for like three hours. There's sort of a <laughs> lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, antagonism between New England native people and the Haudenosaunee. And so, uh, and okay. the Mohawks especially. I mean, the Mohawk were one of the reasons why uh, the New English colonies survived and were able to um, strike back because uh, the Mohawks move in and, and, and do quite a job on the anti-colonial resistance led by King Philip and Wiedemu and others. Um, and so there's a lot of bad blood there. And I have some pretty strong Haudenosaunee and other connections. And so I always try to be a peacemaker there. Um, but yes, no, it's, it, it's a whole can of worms. And, and of, of course, and the memory and the braggadocio that you have in indigenous communities too, uh, in these in these senses of like wars being remembered and so on, it it, it, it can get quite uh, interesting. Some some other questions from the audience. Folks are wondering if you have any sense uh, by talking to people in the Native American communities in New England how they're doing in these times today. I mean, we're experiencing a massive disease again with COVID. Um, and if you have any, if you, you know, just how your personal context and anecdotally, if you have any sense or if you have, any, you know, any research, any pity who's done some surveys of how folks are actually doing in indigenous communities these days. Um, I think there have been challenges before. And I think this is not just New England, but in general, in terms of um, COVID being what it is and especially hitting um, a... Um, the older population very violently and the older population being the, the, the remaining gatekeepers of a lot of languages. And one of those elders gets sick or, or God forbid dies. It's, that, it's a huge loss for communities and it's, it's been happening all over the country. It's, it's very depressing. So yes. And then, I mean, you've had the, <clears throat> all the other issues that, that impact, I mean, places like Lowell, Manchester, 
uh, the less fortunate uh, areas around and in Boston more dramatically have also had. I mean, we have an, an issue in in the United States with poverty and how we treat our poor. And this is urban African Americans, it's rural Native Americans, it's white West Virginia, and we can and should do more. But I'm not going to get on a preaching high horse here now. But I mean, it, it is a challenge for a lot of poor folk and it is a lot of challenge it's a challenge for a lot of native american folk that's hitting people hard yeah there's a question and and this is a it's challenging and, and you know is there a count for how many different tribal groups or nations or communities there are in massachusetts or is there a better way even to think about the geographical area and how do we count and i mean maybe that's a somewhat simple question but then the you know the, the next is who gets to decide what a community is and who belongs to which community, and I know that that's that gets really messy really quickly. Yeah, it does. Um, to make a long story short, there in Massachusetts there is two federally recognized: the Mashpee Wampanoags and then the Aquina. I might forget something here, and then you have the Nipmuc. Uh, who are state recognized, but who are not federally recognized. And then you have some other communities. Uh, like the Massachusetts people? I mean, I think that comes to mind, right? Uh, yeah. And oh. I mean, they have sort of subdivided into sort of like the native community. So evolving around the, the, the praying towns. And in m many instances, I think there's better people qualified to talk to that where they are. And I think a lot of these communities, they don't even bother or in the cases that they've tried they've been shut down and they faced a lot of discrimination and therefore they're not not going for it and so that creates a lot of bad blood as i mentioned earlier who gets to tell you what you are and so on and then of course as federal officials would tell you but we got to make sure right because it comes with certain rights and privileges and so it becomes a whole nasty um it can, it, the process is very also very expensive and and then you get, you know, powers like, I, I assume, I actually don't know, because it, it, it started before I was out here and I haven't studied it, but like, the, is the Mohegan Nation associated with Mohegan Sun and the big money? With, yeah. And yeah. I mean, this is what, you had a lot of the casino wealth that helped in the creation. And again, I want to be very careful of how I phrase this, because um, there's a tendency to just think that I mean, the state of Connecticut gets a lot of money out of this. Uh, the healthcare system in Connecticut is very much funded by the casino wealth. But there were wealthy investors that ended up spending a lot of money as part of the investment of creating these casinos. And that certainly helped. And I had several friends in graduate school that uh, I didn't go that route, but they, they made some very a lot of extra money on the side um, doing the kind of research that would help a legal team to establish the case for the Mohegans. And so, <clears throat> of course, you have that established, then you have sort of um, the other side that then made people in mainstream society with a lot of um, certain racial views then take that out of proportion and just saying it's a business, it's money and that, that's how I roll, but then it becomes racialized and quite nasty in that regard too. And there was certainly living in, in, like in, in Western Massachusetts and in, in Connecticut border region at the time where a lot of these discussions were, there are a lot of tired tropes about the casino Indians and a lot of swing, flinging back and forth. And today, I don't think anyone talks. And I mean, we're looking at like a couple of years ago, even in Massachusetts, how eager uh, Deval Patrick was to get, Mashby, come on, start a casino. We need the money. I mean, governments, state governments have very much come to look at, at gaming as a way to, to make money. And that's another side that is part of a, a very complicated story. Um, another question that I know is, is, is several people in the audience are, are, are asking them uh, are, you know, they've heard your accent tonight. They probably didn't, maybe they didn't watch our, our promotion or your, the, the promotional video where you and I talked about it a bit. So can you just in a few words, talk about how you got interested in this? Um, 
Yeah. What's your, what's your personal interest? You don't, you know, you're not presenting as indigenous yourself and you've been very forthcoming in the past that you are not indigenous. So what's, you know, what does this mean personally to you? How did you get into this research? No, I, I grew up in, um, in Germany. And so uh, I spent a lot of the, uh, my young years studying uh, the history of the Nazi Holocaust <clears throat> and spent a lot of time thinking about um, history as it shapes you and sort of the responsibilities that come with, um, with certain collective burdens and issues of shame and guilt. And as I always tell you, my students, this is not a shame and guilt class. This is stuff you need to know about. Um, and I'm certainly not, I, I, I'm, I'm a pretty happy person, I think. And, and so I do deal with a lot of sadness. But for me, I always find this is something that constructively we need to engage in. We need to have conversations about. We need to be as honest about it as possible. And sometimes we need to disagree and not be jerks about it. And um, maybe that comes from my position of privilege, and it probably does. Um, but at the same time, I feel like coming out of the, the German school system where history and I've spent a lot of trips in on two concentration campsites from Poland to all over Germany as like from age nine to 10 on. In fact, I dragged my own poor children to um, concentration ca campsites and uh, it's a conversation I have with them. And when we go to places like Deer Island, they will get the little mini sermon and uh, sorry. <laughs> Um, so if you think these, uh, this hour and 15 minutes was depressing, <laughs> come live in my house. <laughs> um, but I think as a country, we, we need to have these conversations and we need to have these conversations honestly. And I know this is not necessarily where we are and, and the debates now of how history needs to be patriotic. I, I think history is history. It's, uh, it's not patriotic. It's something that happens in the past and then you learn from it. And um, yeah. Thank you. I'm uh, going ahead and putting a list for additional readings uh, that you shared with me. I'm, I'm, I just put that in the chat and I'll put it uh, out on YouTube and Facebook for people to see as well. Um, I'm not getting any other questions um, right at the moment, but maybe people will chime in as I, as I pace <laughs> these out um, as well. Uh, and maybe we could tech. We had, we do have a couple minutes before we need to call it a night. Maybe um, we could talk about this reading list a little bit if you'd like. Um, we could share a screen yes. and, and actually show it to yeah. people. Oh, you got um, okay. Yeah. So what? Yeah, I can. Uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Let me just pull it up on a screen that's easier for me to share because I have way too many screens open here. Um, that'll work. Uh, where am I? Here we go. So I just shared a link to this reading list and it's actually, um, yeah, so everybody who has the link can go out and see it uh, and there's links in the reading list. Um, so you can uh, go and I don't know if you want to tell people anything about any of these books. There's some new stuff, uh, obviously yep. Lisa Brooks and we have it just, or um, I think it's, I think it's, we have it alphabetical by author right now. So yeah. Um, so, yeah, so Lisa Brooks, yeah, yeah, walk us through a little bit. Tell us yeah, about Lisa things. Brooks' book is uh, a new book that came out on King Philip's War. Uh, Lisa teaches at Amherst College, and uh, she is sort of of the new generation, not sort of, but she's a new generation of indigenous scholars that are uh, joining the ranks of academia, and that's a great thing. Um, then William Cronin is sort of the, ch the book Changes in the Land, talks a lot about the land use issues and, and how indigenous people transform the land. David Grant, Killers of the Flower Moon is an extremely readable book, has nothing to do with New England, but it it, it's just a very good, if you're into crime, uh, it's, 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 a nice, it's a nice read. Uh, Dan Mandel, it's an excellent book on, on Southern New England in the late 18th and 19th century. It's, uh, it was very influential on when I worked on my book and sort of understanding that period, which is very much understudied in, in New, New England and the Northeast, the 19th century, it used to be the 20th century, which was horrible. And the 19th century, we kind of forgot about. And now there's more stuff done on the 20th century. And now we actually realizing how understudied the 19th century is. Um, <clears throat> Margaret Allen Newell's book, Brethren by Nature, deals with this whole 
issue of slavery and the um, the debate on about the Pequods, I the Pequod slave, and she comes very much down on, as you can see, kind of the origins of American slavery, that it is the origins of American slavery, and some uh, some other scholars have have taken issues with there, but I think she does a fairly um, she's very solid on the sources and so on. Um, then Joseph Nicolar, the life and traditions of the red men. Uh, um, and that link is actually to the, you can actually read it right online. So that's that link. Most of these are catalog links, but I remember that Nicolar's is, is out there. It's, it's, you yep. know, freely available for anybody with an internet access. So. And in, in for me, it's, I still think it's a, it's a great book. And then Gene O'Brien talks about, um, the native community. It's a very, Excellent. Oh, no, sorry. She also, she also has a book on the native community, but this one deals especially with the 19th century and sort of the, the role that uh, New English writers play in really writing Native Americans out of existence. And, and, and it's sort of an interesting cultural take of, of sort of how history is created and how Native Americans are really uh, forgotten and sort of how this sort of myths of wilderness and so on. I mean, it was there with colonists like Bradford and before, but it really becomes part of the, the, the mainstream narrative in the 19th and early 20th century. And then, um, yeah, Dunbar Ortiz, the indigenous people of the United States. If you just want to read one book on a general history, I think it's very affordable. Um, and it's very, um, it's very accessible. Um, Howard Russell, Indian New England before the Mayflower is a, is a very readable, like of the pre-1620 uh, history. Neil Salisbury, Manitou and Providence, uh, very good, again, for getting the 16th and 17th, early se first half of the 17th century, very good, good book. David Silverman, uh, This Land is Their Land, is sort of a Wampanoag folk history of Thanksgiving, but also the whole story of, of early 17th century colonization. Then, because I'm very conceited, uh, I've put my own book in there. Uh, don't buy it, get it from your library. I think, uh, uh, I think Clayton was kind enough to purchase a, a copy for, um, uh, for the Quincy Library. So if you're in the Boston area, I know in the Merrimack River Valley, they've got three copies that you could get. And Lowell does have a copy and then I think Newburyport and some other library have. And so you can get it through library exchange if you're up there. Um, and then Charles Wilkinson, Blood Struggle. But the reason why I put it on the list is because there is no, if you're reading, want to read one book that does it all in one volume, uh, this is it. I wish I was a better writer, but it is what it is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you have Charles Wilkinson, which deals a lot, but more out west with the sort of struggles of of modern Indian nations uh, and, and sort of with a lot of questions that the questions were based on, but more out, out west rather than New England. I know there's, I mean, that's a small sample of the books that have been written on this subject. And I'm not asking, I don't want to ask you to diss um, authors out there, but perhaps any words of caution if, if people are, are looking at other stuff. I know that there's a lot of books that you're not so crazy about that are out there. And I think it's on, it's, it's important to talk about, you know, uh, if there's any flags perhaps when you're, when you're looking at, the, at a book jacket, oh, I've never seen this before. Oh, wait a second. I'm not going to read spend any time with this. I don't know. I, I mean, I think my philosophy about everything is be critical with anything you approach. Uh, try and and I'm I, I tend to not be dismissive of of books because there is sometimes people are like oh, he's a local author he doesn't have a PhD but then I look at some local authors and they do a terrific job. I'm actually using a a, a book right now in a course which is done by a person who is a historic reenactor, but it's a good book and it's readable. So, um, yeah, I mean, of course, if, if you kind of read a like late 19th century and you have a lot of wilderness and nomads gambling and running around naked, then you kind of will realize, yeah, maybe not a great source. Uh, but I think that a lot of readers are educated enough to, um, to get through that. So perhaps it's uh, depictions in popular media that it, it's a way more problematic. Um, so 
Are there any, we didn't include any movies on there. Are there any fictional accounts of indigenous life in New England that you think actually got it right? Um, or are, have you heard of any, you know, Last of the Hicans with Daniel Day-Lewis, uh, obviously, you know, comes to mind. Uh, I mean, there's so many classic films about white guys dressing up in red face, but... Uh, yeah, I've had such a horrible experience in my childhood in Germany uh, with all these like old 50s and 60s Westerns. So my, my childhood was probably more that people in their 60s and 70s are used to. And so I just start, start, <laughs> stopped watching movies on that genre. Um, and then, of course, the, the, the crazy Germans with their own obsession about Native Americans, they have that whole subgenre of... Um, <clears throat> noble savage stereotypes uh written by a german author named karl may who's like a big big time author who sold books in like in like uh i mean at levels that any author today would just <laughs> but anyway so yes <laughs> so it's i mean yeah but i also think again when once you sort of like you cut through the biases and then sometimes it's just fine to be entertained but i i'm the wrong person to talk about movies all right fair enough well there is lots of people expressing appreciation across all the different channels that i'm watching everybody wants to say thank you, thank you uh, so much for sharing uh for just um being so you know self-effacing and and, and humble um with some you know and, and, you don't and, know me <laughs> <laughs> No, it's my pleasure, and uh, you you can find my email on the uh, on the intrawebs. Go to the uh, UMass Lowell History website. Uh, drop me a line if I can be of any assistance. Um, thanks, thank you all for coming out tonight, or or whatever you call it. <laughs> Zooming in, out. right? <laughs> that is already like uh, I'm. I I live in the 16th and 17th, and sometimes 18th century. And, uh, Yes. So, um, but no, thanks everyone for coming out and it was my pleasure and stay safe everyone. All right. Yes. Everybody, please stay safe. These are challenging times and um, hopefully we can learn something from all this history and, and be kinder to each other as we go forward. So yeah. Epidemics could be worse. Ask a native American. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's quite a note to end it on. All right. Thank Sorry. You. That was maybe totally inappropriate, but anyway, <laughs> um, but yes. Uh, all right. Stay safe, everybody. Take care. Good night. Thank you.